Alfred Russell Wallace was a 19th century naturalist that traveled a bunch of islands and discovered the theory of evolution by natural selection in 1858. Sounds just like someone else that we know, right? Naturalists at the time tended to be fairly wealthy. They had great educations and often traveled aboard ships. Thank you. As sort of an intellectual companion for the captain, Charles Darwin himself, when he went aboard the Beagle, was trying to avoid boredom and uh, avoid his family's pressure to join the clergy. Um, so he had a fairly comfortable ride, and he had a lot of time on his trip to ponder life's great mysteries. <laughs> Alfred Wallace was different. He was poor. He dropped out of school at 14 because his family couldn't afford it. His brother trained him to be a surveyor, which was the only professional training that he had. Uh, he had a bunch of odd jobs for a while after that. And uh, in his late teens, he met a young entomologist named Henry Bates, who turned him on to collecting beetles, like you do. And <clears throat> Wallace was just fascinated with how many different kinds of beetles there were in the world, and he was a plucky guy, very optimistic, and he thought to himself, you know, I want to figure out where species come from. So he concocts a plan, and he and Bates are going to collect animals to sell to wealthy Victorian collectors, which was considered kind of lowbrow at the time. Uh, but that was how they were going to fund their trip. And at 25 years old, he and Bates, who was 23, headed off to the Amazon River to explore. It's right there. <coughs> While he was there, Wallace collected thousands of specimens uh, and preserved them in a regional alcohol, which he had to hide from the locals who thought that pickling bugs was a shitty use for perfectly good moonshine. He had to learn how to smoke bird skins over a fire to keep the ants and the maggots and mold from rotting them. He navigated a thousand miles of Amazon River rapids and waterfalls in a canoe and mapped it because he was a surveyor. So he made a map of a tributary called the Rio Grande. This whole time, Plucky Wallace has got Chigo flees, burrowing holes in his feet. He's being bitten by gnats. He gets malaria. His toes and his nose were chewed upon by vampire bats. He, of course, he gets dysentery, but does not die. <laughs> his younger brother, Herbert, joins him to try his hand at being a naturalist and doesn't like it, so he decides to head home. But before he can, he gets yellow fever and does die. <clears throat> After four years, Wallace is like, man, I gotta, I gotta go home. So... <clears throat> He gets halfway down river and finds out that most of the specimens over the last several years that he thought he was sending off to England to be sold have been held up at customs. So he gets it all out of customs, packs it up, gets aboard a ship <laughs> called the Helen, which 26 days into the trip catches fire, sinks. <clears throat> he loses his entire collection, including a bunch of live animals. He spends 10 days in a lifeboat uh, getting sunburned and identifying birds, gets picked up by an entirely different ship, but suspiciously similar which almost sinks but doesn't and drops him upon the shores of England. Ah, he made it. At this point, Wallace has got nothing to show for his trip except for a handful of notes, some drawings of palm trees, and holes in his feet from the fleas. He's sad. He spends four days mourning this and getting over it. And before he writes a letter to a friend saying, you know what, I thought about never going back to sea again, but... If I was going to go, I'd go to the Andes or the Philippines. Four days, and this guy's already planning his next trip. This is not some manicured, high-society petunia. Alfred Russell Wallace is a dash fire mother strummer. Yeah. I had to translate this into Victorian slang for you guys because Samuel Jackson hadn't been invented yet. Um, <clears throat> He's home for only a year and a half, during which time he writes two books and a bunch of papers, plans a whole other trip, at this point, this guy has got the skills that he learned in the Amazon to navigate tropical ecosystems like a diphmus and heads off to explore Indonesia, which at the time had only been seen by a handful of Europeans and was called the Malay Archipelago. Wallace would later write a book about this called The Malay Archipelago, published in 1869 and has never been out of print since. Yeah. Oh, a bit of science, guys. Islands act as microcosms of continental ecosystems. They're like little isolated experiments in ecology and evolution. Isolation plus time yields new species. And the Malay Archipelago has some of evolution's greatest oddities like pygmy elephants, giant boars who have tusks that grow right through the top of their skull, giant lizards, the freaky freaky tazier, <laughs> flightless birds, and this weird monkey cat bear thing. It's called a binturong. It has a prehensile tail, and it smells like popcorn. 
Wallace is in the Malay Archipelago for eight years, during which time he travels 14,000 miles on 60 or 70 separate trips, makes a map of it. Uh, he collects 126,000 species, about 5,000 of those are new to science. Thank you. And since he's poor, he's collecting these things to sell, and so he's inspecting each and every specimen very closely. He notices a few things. He notices that there's a wide range of differences within the individuals of a certain species. Uh, he notices that similar species in a region seem to come from common ancestors, and then he notices one big glaring pattern across the whole archipelago as he travels. He notices that animals on the east side of the archipelago are very closely related to animals that you find in Australia, and animals on the west side are more closely related to animals that you find in Asia. So he knows a little bit of geology, and he, he deduces correctly that during an ice age, when sea levels were lower, those two halves of the archipelago were connected to their respective continents by land and were one continuous ecosystem. The water came up, separated those islands, isolation plus time yields new species. Um, <clears throat> we know now that there is a deep water trench that separates the two halves of that archipelago and they were never connected by land. This is still called the Wallace Line today. So about halfway through his trip, Wallace is in his hut just tripping his face off on malaria or dengue or some other horrifying tropical cyclic fever. Uh, and he has this scientific epiphany. He's thinking, you know, seems like ecosystems have an influence on species and more individuals are born than survive. Ergo, only the very fit and the very lucky survive long enough to reproduce pass on those successful traits to successive generations. Holy crap, it's natural selection. <laughs> he comes out of his stupor, he writes it all down succinctly in a handful of pages, and then he sends it off to a guy that he knows is working on this, Charles Darwin. Oh, dastardly. Look at you guys so judgmental already. <laughs> so <clears throat> Darwin sees his own ideas presented back to him, and he's like, holy crap, it's natural selection. Uh, he's been working on this at home for about 20 years. Uh, he was not a very good naturalist. Uh, naturalists at the time weren't very good at labeling where they got their specimens from. He didn't even know which islands his finches came from, and Wallace was the first to realize how important it was to write that down. Uh, so consequently, Darwin's been at home working on this theory for 20 years, knowing that it's going to take a lot of evidence to, to prove this to the world, and here's this young buck presenting his own ideas to him. Wallace, uh, or sorry, Darwin kind of panics a little bit. So he asks a couple of famous scientist friends of his, uh, Joseph Hooker and Charles Lyell. Hooker and Lyell <laughs> sounds like the title of a 19th century buddy constable sitcom. <laughs> <coughs> These two guys are like, well, what do we do with this? And so they take Darwin and Wallace's ideas and they present them together to the Linnaean Society only two weeks after Darwin receives this letter without consulting Wallace about this at all, who's still in the Malay Archipelago. They present them in this paper, placing Darwin's ideas first, sort of giving him priority. Now, uh, one year after that, so Darwin's been working on this huge tome that he's like, one day I shall publish, but then he's now pressured. And so he writes what he calls an abstract, which turns out to be on the origin of species by natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life uh, in 1859, one year later. An abstract. This thing's huge. <coughs> um, so many learned historians and wizened scholars have debated whether or not Darwin did something shady here. It kind of seems like some wealthy, well-to-do scientists were, uh, were kind of trying to pull one over on a young naturalist. Um, I don't really think it matters. Uh, if you look at how they presented themselves to the public, they only had mutual admiration for each other publicly. They presented Wallace's ideas along with Darwin's and on par with his. He lived a life as a celebrated scientist. Darwin actually advocated for Wallace to get a government stipend since he was poor, which he eventually got and lived off of. Uh, and Wallace was a devout advocate for Darwin's genius work and his experiments at home because he had the means to do that. Darwin also celebrated Wallace's genius for having noticed uh, what he did because he was so resourceful in the field. Now, I can't overstate how important the theory of evolution by natural selection is to science. It is considered the unifying theory of biology. It ties together biology, ecology, geology, um, uh, genetics and biochemistry. It's, it's considered to be one of the most, if not the most, single most important discovery in science ever. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
this, this co-discovery by two men at exactly the same time uh, is also considered to be the single most important scientific coincidence of all of science history. So, these two men, uh, though, though Darwin easily had the means to bury Wallace's work, they didn't. These two men thought that it was more important to deliver the theory of evolution by natural selection to humanity than it was who got credit for it. Darwin wrote about Wallace towards the end of his life, or rather wrote to Wallace. He wrote, I hope it is satisfactory to you, and very th few things have been more satisfactory to me, that we have never felt any jealousy towards each other, though in some, one sense rivals. Wallace later wrote, I also look upon it as a most fortunate circumstance that I had a short time ago commenced correspondence with Mr. Darwin on the subject of varieties, species, since it has led to the earlier publication of a portion of his researches and has secured him a claim of priority. Darwin probably would not have published his work when he did had he not received Wallace's letter. So, good people, I would like for you to raise your glasses. May we avoid petty politics and lift each other up in our exploration of greater truths. Science!